Hello, I am Andrea Stella. I'm the author of The Debugging Book, and I'm here to present you a new chapter. <laughs> okay, I will allow him to talk again. So now you can talk and mute yourself and talk. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I raised my hand, but I, I want to ask some questions. Um, I already wrote in the forum. Um, um, you, you wrote this GUI debugger, yes. And I, I want to have a GUI debugger which uh, can, which not only runs over the snapshots, so the GUI debugger should um, step by step, uh, also the, the GUI debugger lives, uh, lives in the present, like mm -hmm. the console debugger, okay. but there's a problem. So we have the inter inter interaction loop. Actually, um, we do, uh, this uh, input command, which waits for the user input. And now we need something like this for the Jupyter widgets. <laughs> uh, yes. So uh, <laughs> if you do a while true loop uh, in the Jupyter main thread and then click on buttons, the main thread uh, didn't recognize uh, the, the button click event. Mm -hmm. So we can't react on this. Mm -hmm. So how should we get those events? I, I mean, you can do async stuff, but mm -hmm. this async don't work. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yield don't work too. I don't know. I, I know I could uh, do uh, yes, debugger, uh, execute all until uh, end and then uh, go to the start and then I can go over my snapshots. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, but I I don't like this. <laughs> the answer is the answer is um, the answer is don't. <laughs> no, sorry. Um, thing is, so, if you so, want so, to, uh, if you want to build an interactive debugger that works on live program rather than the time traveling approach that we are having in our project, okay, where you first collect the data and then you have a UI to explore the data. If you want to do this live, um, then you're in some trouble because you will need two threads, parallel yes. threads at least, that will one for one that runs the actual debugger user interface and the other one which runs the, pro which runs the program that you want to set up. And you have to set up communication between these threads and none of this is particularly easy to do. So you're in for another for you're in for another extra week of hacking only to only to set this up. So stick to the time traveling paradigm. This is going to make this is going to make your life much easier. Okay, so you would let the debugger run the trace method, yep. collect the snapshots, and then the GUI just iterates over this yes. over these snapshots. Yes, much easier. Okay, then I do this. Thank you. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> but um, we have a fourth project in which you can do whatever you like. So in which, um, in, in which you're free to come up with any topic as long as it relates to automated debugging. This way you can build a tool. And if you want to, yes, this could also be something for you to explore at this point. But for the, for the time being, stick to the time traveling paradigm because uh, in particular building a GUI for that is easier. Okay, we have more questions. No, we don't have more questions. We have the Lord of Change who explains us that XD means love. Thank you very much, now I know. Okay. Mm. I see no open questions and I see nothing in the chat. Oh, doesn't seem like it. Konstantin, Johannes, okay. Can we do the fourth project in groups? We don't know this yet. Uh, this depends on the this depends on the project. We're going to announce specifics about that um, in the next year. Well, which is not so far away, which is in five weeks from now, actually. Okay, no open questions left. Good. Then we're going to go directly to the next chapter. The next chapter is about asserting expectations. It's about asserts and internal checks. 
And the neat thing about this chapter from your perspective might be that it's not covered by any of our three formal projects, which then again means that you can actually go and uh, make this a base of your individual fourth project. So let us go right into the chapter on asserting expectations and I'll give you a quick tour. No, 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 here we go. Okay, you should now be able to see my screen here. Johannes, Konstantin, can you confirm? Not yet. Okay, because I see it very well, so that's the thing. No. No, nothing? Okay, let me try again. By the way, ah, another question so i think i think I, pre I think i forgot to press the button here okay good i get it okay uh, try again oh we have another question when is the deadline of the second project are we expected to work on it over the christmas break you can work so the answer is um the deadline for the next project will be in uh so since the first project just started and it's three weeks the next project will be out in three weeks and the deadline for this will also be three weeks after but that's three weeks, not in real time, but three weeks in lecture time. Since you have a two weeks break, two week break over Christmas, um, you're going to have a, uh, you, 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 can, you can finish the project in three weeks, even if you do not do anything over Christmas. Well, if you do not anything course related over Christmas. That was the open question. And I think it's closed already. That was very quick. So you're not supposed to. So you're not supposed to work on this over Christmas. But you know, when you're when you're sitting beside the Christmas tree and there's all the Christmas music and the Christmas cake and the Christmas relatives and everything, I mean, if you want to see something else, sure, go work and hack a bit along, and then you will come down. But when you come back from that, you will be a new, you will be an entirely new person because you come up with a fresh mind, and then you're going to enjoy Christmas again. But that's all up to you. Okay, so let me try again. Christmas relatives, indeed. Let me try again to share my screen here. So, second attempt. I'm pressing the share button, and lo and behold, share, share. I press share. There's a big blue button which says share. Okay. Yeah, now I can see things. Now you can see things. Ah, how beautiful. This is modern technology. I mean, if even the British Prime Minister sometimes has hiccups with zoom why should i have why shouldn't i have any problems okay so this chapter is about asserting expectations and this is actually one of the oldest techniques in debugging at all um, which can be traced back to um, alan turing you know, Alan Turing, of course, the Turing Award, uh, the Turing machine, founder of computer science, or one of the big founders of computer science, uh, who actually invented or at least described this method for the first time in 1947, that is, uh, at the very, very beginning of the computing profession. And the idea of an assertion is to have the computer perform checks on the internal state of the program, as well as on um, any computation results while the program is executing. The idea here is that if you're working interactively as with an interactive debugger, um, you step through the program and you look at the program state and you compare the program state with whatever you have in mind. And this of course, well, this works but, it's a, but it can be a rather tedious activity in particular if you have to do this many times or if you have to cover lots and lots of different uh, variables and states. And it's actually precisely for such tedious and repeating uh, activities that computers were invented in the first place to actually do the work. So the idea is to have the computer do the checking for you while the program is executing and since modern computers have millions of extra CPU cycles, they have no idea how to, they have no idea how to properly use them. So why not use them to check results? And since these results can, and since this checking can be very um, 
it's, it can be very extensive. You can check an individual condition for a long time, or you can also check lots and lots of condition also in short time. It's a very, very efficient way to have the computer catch errors. And on top of that, um, the assertions, because that's the mechanism you use for writing such checks actually can stay in your code, thus also help others to debug and help others to see what you actually had in mind or to understand your code. So what is this wonderful, what is this wonderful magical thing that does all of this? Typically, this is typically this is realized in a single um, in a single construct. This is the so-called assert function or keyword and assert as we have it here. So this is assert in Python uh, does nothing particular. It simply checks a condition. And if this condition is true, it continues as usual. So we have assert true. So here we go. I just did assert true. Nothing happens. It just simply evaluated true. We can also put in anything else that is true, say um, assert two plus two equals four. There we go. This is also true. So if the condition evaluates to true, nothing happens. But if the condition evaluates to false, so if I write, for instance, two plus two equals five, that, that's rather boring still. Then, what's, and then what, ha what happens is that we get an assertion error. That is the, pro the uh, statement raises an exception. And well, unless we do anything particular to catch this exception, this means that the, that the program is terminated. And we also get information about uh, the place where this happens. And we can also see the assertion. Actually, the, uh, the assert can also, um, uh, I can also say, um, I can also give an extra error message if I recall it right. So um, I could say um, two plus two equals five. That's actually a quote from 1984. Uh, Winston, Winston, oh, is Winston? I'm not, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure enough for that. So let's simply stick with two plus two equals five. And you can say two plus two is five. And we love, oops, and we all love Big Brother. There we go. For those of you who've read 1920 from 1984, you will understand what this is. And you can see that the string that we actually add here as an error message is also reported in the failing assertion. But by default, we can simply say assert true, and then nothing happens. So what do we do with such assertions? The way we use such assertions is uh, twofold. First, we use such assertions in tests. That is, for instance, to check whether a particular function yields the result that we want to have. So if we have, a, say, a square root function, and we want to check that it works properly, then we can say, I want to assert that the result of this particular call equals this particular value. So the square root of four is two, square root of nine is three, and this should all work just properly. And um, we can also write our own assertion function in here. That's not too complicated. And assertions actually exist in all programming languages in some form or another. Sometimes it's a bit more complex. So for those of you who, who like to program in C or C++, in C or C++, um, assertions are implemented as macros. But they work just the same. So you can say, you, know, you can put in an assertion into your code in this case with parentheses, this is C. And uh, if you have such an assertion into your code and it fails, then you get a message that the assertion failed together with diagnostics such as uh, which function actually it is and where this assertion is. There's actually some magic behind that in order to find out where, uh, so uh, in order to have a C program report something like that, which function of uh, a particular a call is in as well as the text of the assertion. Uh, there's actually quite some magic behind it. And um, here I put some, um, I've put some, uh, some definition as this commonly occurs in C programs. And if you always wanted to dig deep into C and C preprocessor programming, well, this is how you build assertions in C. The interesting thing here is, however, that this is conditional. That is, you can actually change the definition of the assertion from 
this big monster here, which actually prints out the error message and checks the error message into this. And this is interesting because if you define this special variable here, be, and when compiling your code, then the, assert, then the assert command does nothing. So it turns into nothing. And that's an important thing. You can turn off assertions as you like. And that's actually also something you can do in Python. If you pass the minus O flag to your Python interpreter, then all assertions will automatically be turned off. Why would one want to do that? Well, the reason is simple. With assertions, you can do lots and lots of checks, and these checks may be pretty time consuming, so you may wish to turn them off in production code, thus getting, uh, thus, um, thus getting back the time that you previously spent on these checks, so your program will run faster, All, although at the same time you will have fewer checks than before, so you have to choose wisely which checks to activate and which one, which one not. So um, let's, make, let's make use of such assertions. So the first part here is where assertions are used besides testing. These are, you can use them as assertions that are checked all the time. And these are used in particular in three different ways. First way is to check preconditions. Precondition meaning that you want to check whether the arguments to a function or to whatever process are actually valid and are as expected. We can stick with our square root function. Square root is ideal for illustrating, for illustrating assertions. If you have a square root function, you may wish to place an assertion at the very beginning. Um, and this checks that the, the precondition for the, for, the, for the number x for which you want to compute the square root, you see assert x is greater or equal to zero because our square root function is not set to compute uh, the square roots of negative numbers. Well, you can also do that. Um, there's complex numbers in Python, but let's not go into that right now. And if you have such a thing, then you can go and you can invoke square root with minus one. And then if, if you do that, you're going to get an assertion error. Uh, if you have um, specifically for Python, you may also wish to check that X actually is an integer or a float. Remember, Python is dynamically typed and therefore there is no type checking going on, which means that you can now also check that uh, if you invoke square root with the wrong argument type, this will also be, this will also be checked. So this is uh, simple preconditions. These check whether arguments are correct. The more fun, however, comes in post conditions. These are assertions that check whether the value is correct the value, um, the computed value is correct. And for a square root function, for instance, if y is the square root that we just computed, then y squared should actually be equal to the value that we passed. And this is again, something which we can place in an assertion. And the really nice thing is that once we do have that assertion in place, then every time that we invoke square root and we get a result back, then this result will be proven correct because it has actually passed the assertion. This is not a guarantee that square root will work under all circumstances. Um, it can still fail, but at least then we get to notice when it fails. So it, if it computes and returns a value, this value will automatically be correct. By the way, um, um, although this is a classic example, y squared equals x, this only works in theory, this only works in mathematics, or if you do symbolic computation. In practice, you may have to go and do a closer check. In particular, you have to, in particular because of rounding errors, you may wish to check that the difference between y squared and x is less than whatever small value you can come up with. Uh, Python provides a method math.isClose for that purpose, which apparently does the right thing and simply checks whether two values are close enough together to be considered equal under the limitations of the of Python computations. So now we can actually go and build a real implementation of square root. So we use a Newton Refsum iteration here, which works and which actually provides us um, the correct square root. So with this implementation, if I do square root of four, I get two. That's right, but I can actually put any number in here and any number I will put in here will automatically be verified at runtime. 
which is a, an absolutely great thing because this means that whatever you put in there, all the results will automatically be checked and you can now perfectly rely on this method. You cannot rely on this method to always produce a square root. I mean, it can still fail the check. And therefore, um, this may still not be the best. This may not be sufficient if you want to put the square root function into, say, a nuclear power plant or an aviation device or anything else that is critical. For this, you really want to prove that the square root function always does the right thing. So you need to do a fixed point iteration, need to do a fixed point iteration of the newton refson method, uh, it involves some mathematics, some deep mathematical thinking. But uh, <clears throat> if runtime verification is enough, if you can live with the fact that it occasionally may fail, then uh, such runtime verification is just, is just perfect. And then you can compute arbitrary square roots and you can perfectly rely on this. Um, <clears throat> so this is the main point of preconditions and postconditions. And in particular, when you're working with an untyped language such as Python, it is always a good idea to put in assertions as much as you can, in, not in, the, in particular regarding types because otherwise you may run into trouble here, but also if you have simple ways to check whether your result is correct or not, then um, please do so. When I say simple checks, this is actually, this is actually a good question. If we think again about our uh, function remove HTML markup, uh, you remember this is the function which is supposed to take out arbitrary HTML markup from strings. Here the question of what is, a, what is the correct post condition is actually tricky because specifying the post condition actually means that, well, <laughs> what is the result of removing HTML markup? The result of removing HTML markup is, well, removing HTML markup. And in the absence, so, so the specification of what should be done is actually close to a second implementation of the whole thing. So if you have a second implementation, an independent implementation, then you can make use of this as a check. But then the question is, if, if you already have a second implementation, which you use for a check, why bother building the first implementation at all? So why doing things twice? If you're in the aviation business, that's actually how they do things. They build things twice, and then they, let, then they compare things against each other. And if there's a deviation, then there's some log message being printed out, some red light showing up in the cabin, and companies like Airbus or Boeing automatically notified that one of their software pieces just produced an invalid result. However, um, in here, well, <clears throat> in here, unless we have a second implementation, there's no good way for us to come up with a full-fledged post condition. However, we can do a simple partial check on our result, and an important partial check in here is and that's very simple. We can make sure that the result no longer contains any HTML tags, which is an obvious, which is an obvious condition. So after we have run any text through our remove HTML markup, then there should be no more markup in here. And that's something we can check. And this is actually a, a post condition which catches several of the errors that we have encountered before. Such, um, <clears throat> such assertions also work. So, and by the way, this actually also works well as documentation for what remove HTML markup does. Namely, it removes any angle braces out of your, uh, angle brackets out of your, out of your, out of, out of the string. Meaning that, well, that's already close, a good appro approximation to removing all HTML tags. Likewise, here we have something, an obscure function um, either x and y and z are equal, or the result is greater than the minimum, and the result is less than the maximum. This is an interesting question. Which function could that possibly be? And yes, well, what is the what is the relationship in here? I will leave this up for you for the quiz. And all of these are all of these are simple ways for you to ensure that parts of your program work correctly. The neat thing about having such assertions also is, as it comes back to debugging, not only do they detect bugs quickly, but they also help you in locating defects quickly. Because if you have a function, and this function is being called, and this function's precondition is satisfied, and then the postcondition is violated, well, where did the error occur? 
obviously in that very function whose precondition was satisfied and whose postcondition was violated. So rather than having this long, 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 long execution, you now know, well, there was this call, here everything was fine, here things were broken, this is where the error was, and then you can immediately jump to that function whose precondition was satisfied and whose postcondition is violated. This is interesting. <laughs> okay, so let us, <clears throat> let us finish with the most important or most useful or uh, most useful, your mileage may vary, uh, but <clears throat> maybe one of, the, one of the most useful usages for assertions. And this cannot be overstated. So, so far we have seen how to check individual functions for whether they work well or not. But you can also use assertions to actually check um, to actually check complex data structures, and this is one of the biggest debugging helps you can ever have. It's I I, I cannot stress this enough how super useful this is. The idea is as follows: so you have a data structure. Well, over here I'm using a time class with fields, hours, minutes, and seconds. So far so good, and the, and the thing is. If any of this data gets corrupted, who knows? Seconds maybe, who knows? Maybe seconds is a value of 100 or maybe hours is negative whatsoever, okay? You're not going to notice that until millions of cycles later or maybe never when somebody actually tries to do something with the corrupted data. And therefore it's important to catch such errors at the very moment they occur. And the idea on how to do that is pretty trivial but super effective. You insert a precondition or an assertion into the functions that actually set these data structures and check whether the data, whether the arguments to set these data structures are actually okay. Or you can actually go one step uh, further. You can, in, you can introduce a special method or a special function that does nothing but checking whether the current data structure as it is, is okay. So this is conveniently called rep okay for okay representation. And this one simply checks whether the hours are valid, whether the minutes are valid, whether the seconds are valid. Uh, by the way, if you wonder why it can be that a, a minute has 61 seconds, this is, actually, this is actually because of leap seconds. Every once in a while, uh, every once in a while, uh, we, ha we, and, um, we have to introduce leap seconds in order to actually um, get the current time in line with the rotation with, with the rotation time of the Earth, such that uh, such that um, years and days are still aligned as they should be. So, um, but as soon as you have such a method in here, which actually checks the current status, and you invoke this, say after any setter, for instance, then you can be sure that this data structure is always okay at all times. And um, you can be, one can be pretty, one, one can be pretty, um, pretty obsessed with that. Um, in particular, if you have very large data structures, here's an example, this is a red black tree. Uh, I don't know whether you have any, ever seen red black trees, Red black trees are among the most efficient search trees ever invented. So you can use them for databases, for search trees in memory, for whatever. In particular, they are always balanced. They are super fast as it comes to adding and deleting elements and whatnot. And they also are the most horrible data structure ever invented as it comes to debugging things. If you ever become a computer science professor and want to torture your students, please go and let them implement a red black tree. In, in particular, since errors in implementation in red black trees are not apparent immediately, they only become apparent after another dozen or a hundred insert or delete operations. And that's when everything breaks down and you can spend hours and hours, if not days to debug a red black tree. Uh, that is, unless you know how to do it. Because see, what is a red black tree? A red black tree, we have a black node at the top, that is the root node, then 
every time. So this always comes in alteration. Black nodes have red children and red children have black children and so on. And um, all these properties of a red black tree form an invariant. And this invariant is something that we can again check with one of these repo K methods. So we can, for instance, say, I want to make sure that my root node never has a parent. Sounds obvious because the root node is defined as the root node, which has no parent. But in the implementation, your nodes may actually have parent pointers. And therefore, you want to make sure that your root does not have a parent pointer that points somewhere. Otherwise, oh, disaster is going to occur. The root has to be black. Well, that's a very easy assertion. Red nodes have only black children and vice versa. So you have to traverse the tree and then you check if the node is red, yes, then the ch children should all be black. And if the node is black, then the children should all be red. There you go. Equal number of black nodes on subtrees. Well, not too, diffi not too difficult either. Count all the nodes on the left side, count all the nodes on the right side. Make sure that these subtrees have a similar number of nodes. Actually, if you do this recursively, that's a bit expensive. So you may actually want to do this iteratively and then compare from the bottom up. Uh, the tree has no cycles. Well, of course, has to be, because if, a, if the tree would have cycles, it would no longer be a tree. This is, of course, um, correct from a theoretical standpoint. But the problem is, if your tree implementation has cycles somewhere in there, and you try to reverse the tree with cycles and cycles and cycles, you're going to end up in an endless loop. And boom, where did this ever come from? And um, parents are consistent. That is, if my if I am a node and I have a couple of kids, and these and ask these kids who are your parents, then the then these kids should actually answer yes, it's all me. There you go. These are all well, <clears throat> not too not too difficult to implement checkers. I mean, it's on the order of something between five and maybe fifteen lines of code for each. And as a whole, this will do a lot. But you know, the thing is that um, <laughs> the thing is that uh, once you have these, whatever function you apply on your red black tree, you will immediately catch the error at the moment it's being introduced. And this is important because, um, well, at the moment they're being introduced, you look up, you can look this up on Wikipedia, red black trees, and you will find that say in the insertion operation is four pages of code. Um, the delete operation is five pages of code. This is incredible. You've never seen anything like that. And there's, there's all the chances in the world that you will get this wrong. Well, unless you copy the code from Wikipedia, I assume. <laughs> and um, with a repo K method, well, you still have the very same chances to get it wrong, but at least you will know. And if you, and if you have such a repo K method, and then you say, fuzz your data structure with plenty of random insert, delete operations in arbitrary orders. So this is very easy to test. You can easily create a long, long list of insert operations and then a list of delete operations and more of these. You just throw millions of these at your red black tree. And if these rep OK methods work under all circumstances, ah, this is such a relief. This gives you so much, so much more confidence in your data structure. By the way, you can do similar things for file systems. You know that, so you can write a checker for a file system that will, um, well, if you do this for every single aspect of your entire file system with every operation that's ever run on your file system, then your file system operations are going to, are going to be tremendously slowed down. But for standard operations such as say adding a file, deleting a file, adding a block to a file. You can do a couple of local checks whether the data structure, whether the data structure of your file system, structure of your file system is still fine. And again, this is going to this is going to find thousands and thousands of errors before they can propagate and create havoc. This chapter closes with a nice extra chapter for those of you who do not program in Python but in a more system language like C. Um, this would be a perfect moment for a raise of hands. Whoever programs in C or C++ or whatever, the main thing in C is, the real fun in C is that uh, you are in control of everything. This includes memory and 
which unfortunately also means that you have to, that you have to, that you are responsible for memory management. Sure, if you want to write a, an operating system kernel, then it's great to be in charge of more memory management because, well, that's the point of an operating system. But if you write um, application programs in C or C++, well, prepare to, to spend some extra time on uh, handling memory and in particular to debug memory issues. So in, uh, in particular, in a language like Python, if you, for, for instance, access an invalid array element, say like this one, what you're going to get is a string index out of range because this is all checked. In C, however, here we go. I just wrote a program here, which does the same. So it builds a string and then it, uh, and then it returns um, an element out of that string. This is the same thing. Um, this in principle should actually result in, a, in an error. Unfortunately, that's not how this works in CMC++. What you're going to get is undefined behavior. Undefined behavior is a very fun term in C. This simply means that anything can happen. The program may crash. The program may do nothing. The program, for whatever reason, may start drawing pink elephants on your screen, deleting your hard drive, or sending out your, or, or sending out your private files into the world. This is all legal C behavior covered by the specification. Just say, it's, it, it would be a rare thing for this to happen, but if, you build, but if you build a C compiler that actually does this, oh, it's undefined behavior. Finally, we can do whatever we want with the, with the user's program. Now, um, it, it, is, it is covered by the C specification. So in our case, uh, what happens is simply nothing. And simply nothing is of course a bad thing because you will have no idea that your program just entered uh, undefined territory and that something really weird has happened behind the scenes. And that from now on your program can fail in any possible way on any possible system whatsoever. And um, you, herein we built a small um, C memory simulator, which is a bit of fun in which we can actually simulate what's going on behind the scenes where we can build some memory and work with that. Um, but the really fun thing which I want to, which I, which I want to highlight here is not so much how these, um, how these C functions work, but rather how we can catch such errors. And this is really neat. And this is something that has um, come up in the last, that has come up in the last years. There's a couple of um, there's a couple of ways, where a couple of new tools that have come up, which allow you to to automatically check whether and how your C programs works with memory, and whether it accesses memory in specified and legal ways, and if not, how to report these things. Um, I'm actually building here uh, such a. I'm actually building here such a system for you to show how these things work. The main idea is that you that for every uh, piece of memory you record whether this byte was ever allocated and whether it ever was initialized. If you try to access any byte that is not allocated, then you get an error. And uh, initializing simply means, has it been written before it's being read? Because if it has not been written by your program before it's being read, this simply means that you're reading some memory which is uninitialized, which again can have arbitrary, uh, arbitrary consequences. And by setting up either your runtime system or the C compiler to actually track such allocation bytes and such initialized bytes, uh, this allows you to automatically, this, this allows the program at runtime to track whether uh, your memory accesses are safe. There are two major, there are two major tools um, that you can use for that purpose. Again, if you program in C, C++, if you program in Python memory, what is memory? You just rely on Python to do the right thing and you don't worry about it. Oops, there you go. Just, you just run around in your dreamland, never worrying about anything that happens at the system level. However, if you work in C, if you're a, if you're a real programmer, you want to do go down to the core. You want to you want to know every bit personally, and you want to control it, and you want to make sure that your ne program never ever uses any more memory than it could possibly that it could possibly need. 
that's when you can make mistakes and that's when you need these and that's when you need these tools which are called sanitizers and these sanitizers exactly manage the memory by putting in these extra bits and there's two of these which are extremely popular one is valgrind a valgrind is a tool that is actually an interpreter for x86 uh, executables you can actually you can take an x86 executable and run it through valgrind and then the Valgren tool will read each opcode of the x86 program and automatically execute it. And while it's interpreting your x86 code, it can just as well manage memory while it's doing that. And that's actually something it does by default. Actually, an x86 Valgren interpreter could be a neat thing if you have a <clears throat> if you have an ARM machine, say a one of these new Macs, for instance, and you want to run an x86 program on that. You could actually do this via Valgren, that's true. Uh, oh, Apple comes with their own interpreters, which are way better than that. But the but Valgren can take any program. It can even take whatever your favorite Microsoft Office suite whatsoever. So even if you have a third party program or a third party library, which for which you don't have the source code, you can still run this through Valgren. And I remember this, um, remember this access here which in this case is an excess of uninitialized memory. You run this through, you run this through Valgrind and, uh, oops, what is this? Just use after free, oh, okay. How is it possible that this worked yesterday and today doesn't, ah, oh, I fear, no, actually I have set up a new Valgrind version. What is going on here? It worked yesterday, but it didn't, but, but it doesn't work today. No, okay, good. Let's keep it like this. Valgrind is going, but Valgrind normally should run automatically and automatically figure out that your program doesn't work as it should. What is the Linux system? Okay, I'm going to check this out. Um, the chapter, the, the, the available chapter still has the right thing. Okay, um, probably me upgrading my Mac to the newest operating system version. That's probably what's going on here. Ah, oh, see, I should have checked that. Um, if you go to the, if you go to the binder version on Linux, there I have made sure that Valgren is there and Valgren works as it should. Um, second thing here, let's hope that this one works, is uh, checking memory usage with the memory sanitizer. In contrast to Valgren, which is an interpreter of x86 code, a memory sanitizer is uh, is a device that is built in into a compiler. So you compile your program with uh, a memory sanitizer enabled. So that's this extra function here, fsanitize equals address. This enables the memory sanitizer. And then at a runtime, the program itself will make sure, uh, will automatically keep track of all managed memory. So it's memory usage again is going to increase because of all these extra bits required for initialized and allocated memory. And if you do that, you just compile the program, then you run it. And in contrast to Valgrind, where the program can be slowed down by a factor of 10 to 100, depending on, uh, depending on which checks you run. Uh, if you do this with a memory sanitizer that is built into the compiler, the um, extra overhead is much smaller. We're talking about 70%. That is, instead of taking uh, 100 seconds, your program is going to take 107, 170 seconds. So even an interactive program would still be very usable with that. And um, if you do that, what you're going to find out for, if, you, if your program then violates any memory assumption, then you're going to get this wonderful error message, which tells you that, you, that your function has just tried to access some memory which wasn't there. And you can even integrate this with your favorite command line debugger to immediately jump into the debugger at the moment the program fails. And you're going to get error messages whenever your, uh, whenever your C program, whenever your C program fails. Um, there's a very important lesson for you. And this is, a, this is probably one of the most important ones. If you program in C or C++, run your program through memory sanitizers at all times. 
if you don't do this, you're going to you're, you're going to miss out so many so many dangerous bugs. You do this, it's it's a, it's really a minor extra really a minor extra overhead, and it catches so many bugs that are otherwise so hard to find. This is like a big assertion running at all times over your memory in the background with catching all the bugs for you, which otherwise for you as a human would take hours, days, or possibly even weeks to find. So this is, uh, this is an important lesson for all, of you, for all of you who work at the system level. So um, a, couple of, um, a couple of recommendations at the very end. Assertions can check things, but you should not rely on assertions being on, meaning that if you have, um, if you have conditions on third party input, um, which need to be checked, um, say the inputs should not contain any quotes or likewise, then um, you should obviously go and um, not do this via your assertions, but actually via checks that are baked in into production code, um, such that your code still does the right thing, even when assertions are uh, turned off. And also if there are assertions which are rather cheap, such as say variable, such as verifying the square root uh, results, for instance, then uh, consider leaving these on and you're going to check a number of extra errors, even in production code before these errors propagate too far. So this is what we're having for, um, this is what we're having for assertions. We've seen preconditions and postconditions and invariants. The more assertions you have, the earlier errors are detected, the easier it is to locate defects and the better the guidance to failure causes towards debugging. So this is what we're having about, um, this is what we're having about assertions and have fun reading the chapters and go through the, and go through the individual examples. And I'll make sure I'm going to have a new Valgrind version running on my machine such that this will also be reflected again in the chapter. Thank you very much. And I am happy to take questions regarding the chapter. There are no questions yet. No questions. Okay, no questions, nothing in the chat. Great, thank you. Do you want to torture your students? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have the Lord of Change who says, do, do I want to torture my students? Yeah, um, let, me, let me tell you a story on that, on torturing students. Um, <laughs> this is not 20 years ago, but um, 20 years ago, I was, a, I was a programming tutor and my, um, and my, uh, and our professor wanted students to build really good data structures. And he had students build red black trees, which was hard. Okay, so um, the problem was that, so our professor wanted students to build red black trees and we as tutors wanted to catch as many errors as possible. So we built a test framework that would automatically generate plenty of tests for red black trees and check whether they would work properly. This was a big mistake. Because, um, <laughs> because, <laughs> because these, this testing framework found every single bug that the students had. So why was this a mistake? Because my co-tutors and I spent hours and hours and days and nights sitting together with the students and trying to figure out where the bugs were. And this was horrible, both for the students as well as for us. So the next time, next year, when we had students build data structures that would be thoroughly checked, we gave them simple binary trees, which were far easier to implement. Yet, you know, if you have a big test suite that automatically checks these things, <laughs> you, will, you will still catch every error and, it's, and see, it's actually not too hard to build a red black tree with bugs. 
but it's much more difficult to build a bug-free binary tree, which in principle should be the far easier variable. This told us something about reliability. And from there on, and since then, we are far more, we are far happier with a data structure that actually does what it's supposed to do. And having students build that, because there's more to be learned, rather than giving them the whatever most sophisticated version of something on the planet. So um, I'm still, so today I would be happy to give students a red black tree to implement for advanced data structures. However, only after I have told them how to debug these things using an appropriate repo K method. That was, that's the answer to torture students with red black trees. By the way, um, chances that you would ever have to implement a red black tree are close to, are close to, are close to zero because in practice, you don't implement such data structures, you use them. And if you use them, you can rely on hundreds and hundreds of hours of debugging that were already on testing in particular, that were already spent on data structures. Building data structures is something that you do as a student. As a practitioner, it's actually a very rare thing to build your own algorithms and to build your own data structures. You reuse and use whatever you can. But you should know how to do it. This is why we teach that. Because, well, there will always, there, there might always be cases where a stock data structure or stock algorithm may not be sufficient. And this is where you're going to need all your power at this point. That was a long answer to a short question, but no, we don't want to torture students. We want to unleash their creativity as it comes to, as it comes to programming and debugging. So, more open questions? No. No That's questions? It. Okay, great. Johannes Constantin, do you have any questions? Just not today. Just for the sake <laughs> of having questions. No questions right now. Okay, good. Um, then we're going to call it a day. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. I will do my best to post the video as soon as possible, hopefully. Well, today might be difficult, but hopefully today or tomorrow. And um, next week, well, next week we're going to look into our, well, <clears throat> we're going to look into a debugging method that um, actually does not require us writing specifications and still does a pretty good job in identifying, <clears throat> in identifying where errors are and where they come from. This is called statistical debugging, but that's something we're going to look into next week. Thank you much for attending. Been a pleasure. See all of you. Bye-bye.